Hey everyone, and welcome to the ATA Podcast. I'm Matt Baird. And I'm Andy Ho. This podcast is brought to you by the American Translators Association. Each month, we bring you news and insights from ATA. We look at what's happening across the association, explore the benefits of membership, and discuss the translation and interpreting professions. That's right. You know, the t and industry is always changing, and we hope this podcast will help you keep up with it. ATA was founded over 60 years ago to advance the translation and interpreting professions and foster the professional development of individual translators and interpreters. We have nearly 9,000 members in more than 100 countries. If you'd like to know more about ATA, we'll have some information for you at the end of the show. And you'll also find links in the notes. All right, let's get started with a few quick announcements. Hey, translators and interpreters. It's no secret that machine translation and AI technology are making great strides. Don't be left behind. Join ATA's virtual conference on May 20th for an educational and energizing look into how MT and AI are shaping the translation and interpreting professions. Discover how you can leverage these advancements in your work as a language professional. Register today. Also, are you following ATA on social? If not, you should be. ATA is active on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Follow your favorite channel and keep up with the latest news and insights from one of the world's largest associations of translators and interpreters. And finally, the latest issue of the ATA Chronicle is out. In the March-April edition, you'll find articles on audio basics for remote interpreting, passive income streams, educational translation and interpreting, and more. Find out whether you should start a translation agency or why ATA opposes Oregon Senate Bill 584. It's all in there, including our regular updates from ATA's president, president-elect, and executive director. Read it online or download your PDF copy today. For more information on each of these announcements and more, look for links in the show notes. Joining me now is David Stevenson. David is the chair of ATA Certification Committee. He is an ATA certified translator in German, Dutch, and Croatian to English, and has been an independent translator for over 30 years. His specializations include civil litigation, corporate law, economic development, and creative nonfiction. David was also the recipient of the 2022 ATA Impact Award. You can reach David at david at bullcitylang.com. David, welcome back to the podcast. Great to be here, Matt. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's really great to have you back on. You know, the last time you were on the show was in June 2022, I'm sure you remember, just under a year ago or so, and that was episode 74. And what we talked about back then was the fact that the ATA certification exam had recently been made available on demand. So that was a a new thing. So how about we start this episode with a quick update? How's the online exam going and what's the response been like? Well, uh, after we bottomed out in 2020 because of COVID, and that's when we were still just doing in-person, and we couldn't because of COVID, in in 2021, when we first launched the the online exam, we had about 250 candidates, and in last year, we were up to 400, uh, about three-quarters of them online. So we do expect that ratio to continue skewing towards the online option. And looking ahead, it's possible we'll end up discontinuing the in-person model entirely. Already this year, in 2023, we've stopped doing in-person sittings outside the U.S. because it's it's massively expensive and there's always a chance of red tape, like uh, things getting delayed at customs and so on. And with the online exam available worldwide, then that's that's where we're referring people who want to do want to take the exam outside the U.S. Right on. That sounds like a fairly logical progression development. Now, last year, we also discussed the exam's overall pass rate, which is, I understand, less than 20%. Has that changed at all since the exam has been available on demand? I don't have any firm figures for that, but um, anecdotally, some language pairs have reported a slight bump in their pass rate since the online exam began, which could be due to a backlog of qualified candidates who, who didn't have access to an in-person sitting now now finally um, earning certification. 
Um, as far as pass rates go, there will be a, a very interesting article in an upcoming chronicle about pass rate trends uh, written by Jeff Kobe. So be sure to look out for that. That's a good tip. Thank you for mentioning that. Now, in episode 74 last year, you also explained that the pass rate is, you know, kind of a complicated matter. Can you take a moment to remind our listeners why that is? Yeah, it's complicated, um, but there are a few patterns that we tend to see um, over and over again. Um, a lot of candidates aren't translating into their native or, or strongest language, and so they may have tr trouble with uh, getting the grammar and the, and the usage down just so, um, and little mistakes in those areas can really add up and, and end up in a failing score. Some candidates are heritage speakers of their target language, and so they may be conversationally fluent, but they're, they never had formal training, and so they're it shows through in the exam. And, and sometimes people are just think that, that they come forward and say, I want to be a translator, so I need to get certified. And they're, they don't realize how rigorous it is. And it's not really intended for uh, beginning translators. I made that mistake myself when I took the exam, I think back in is either 2000 or 2001, or maybe even earlier. And I had only been translating for a couple of years. And boy, um, I even I failed the practice test miserably and still decided to take the exam and, of course, failed the exam, too. So that was a, a learning experience. So to I all everyone listening, that, yeah. yeah, to everyone listening out there, if you're a beginning translator, the certification exam is probably not yet for you. Now, you recently wrote a column on the subject we're talking about today, and it was in the November-December 2022 issue of the ATA Chronicle, the uh, our association's flagship um, publication. And it was entitled, I Failed the Practice Test, Now What? I, I wish I would have had, been able to read that article you know, 20 years ago. And... That's what we're really here to talk about today. Uh, in, now, in that column, you really dive into the details and you provide a lot of insights for members who have taken and failed the practice test. And you list a number of ways to prepare for the exam. We're going to talk all about that in the next few minutes. But first, let's remind listeners what the practice exam is and how they can take it. Right. So the, the practice test is a, is a retired exam passage that's graded by the same exam graders applying the same standards as in the exam. But unlike the exam itself, the graded practice test is returned to the candidate with the actual scoring as well as feed, feedback and explanations. And we strongly recommend that people do one or more practice tests before registering for the exam. They cost for ATA members, it's $80. For non-members, it's $120. So it's, so it's highly affordable compared to the exam registration fee, which is 525. Uh, and it's a very effective way for people to see if they're ready for the exam. Um, we always say that, you know, for best results, you should you should uh, take the exam, do, do the practice test under exam conditions. So within 90 minutes, um, because the exam is three hours, but it's two passages and the practice test is just one passage and using only the approved list of resources, which is available on the ATA website. Okay. All right. So let's say I've taken the practice exam and failed, like the title of your column. Now what? If I score in the low 20s, I'm good to go, but anything higher, I should do more prep work? Well, first, no matter what your score is, you should certainly take a close look at the specific error markings in your test and, 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 and try to identify patterns. When the marked test is returned to you, it's accompanied by what we call the framework for standardized error marking, which is basically a grid that, that can help you identify these patterns because they're broken, the errors are broken down into transfer errors and mechanical errors. So mechanical errors is what we call um, things like, and that's in the bottom section of the framework, that's say grammar usage errors, spelling, punctuation, things like that. Um, so if that's a problem, if you, if you see it, uh, errors clustered in that area, then you know to work on those mechanical, those, those aspects of your, um, your target language writing. Or did you have trouble understanding the source text? Or maybe just transferring the meaning between the source and the target was tricky. So, so that's your, really your first step at figuring out how you want to uh, uh, prepare yourself more for the exam before, uh, based on your practice test results. Um, so, so if mechanical errors are an issue, then, then you should think about maybe doing formal study or a refresher of your target language. Um, on the other hand, 
if you're having problem understanding what's going on in the passage, then maybe you need further study of the source language. And if you're having trouble with transfer aspect, then maybe targeted translator training may be in order. And there are various um, venues for that. Okay. You know, that makes a lot of sense. If I'm making mechanical errors in the target text, I should brush up on my grammar and my writing skills. You know, even if I'm a native speaker, should add that. And if I misread the source text, I might need to improve my source language skills. And I guess if I struggle with rendering the meaning, you know, transferring it, as you said, I probably need to, you know, go out and learn some more tricks of the translation trade, so to speak, right? Right. Yeah, it's going to be different for each individual. I mean, you really should take a close look at the specific errors and answer those questions. All right. Now, your column goes on to list several ways to prepare for the exam that would likely apply to anyone. Um, your first tip is read. And what do you mean by that? Well, uh, exam passages tend to present a progression of thought and reasoning. And so that's a writing style you often find in, say, newspaper editorials or opinion pieces or essays or magazine articles. So find sources like this in your source and your target language and read them just as a, as a matter of day-to-day -day, um, self-education. That'll help you get a better feel for the style and register you're likely to encounter in, to encounter in the exam. And also uh, you can pay attention to the sort of cohesive elements that writers often use to advance their arguments. All right. Your next suggestion is to practice. Do you mean retake the practice exam? No, I wouldn't recommend taking retaking the practice test until you're until you've improved enough. Um, what I meant was by practice is spend time doing practice translations of some of your reading materials, and then ask a trusted co uh, colleague to evaluate your work. Um, alternatively, you could set aside your practice translation for a while and then back translate it for comparison with the source text, and that could reveal not only shifts in meaning that crept in or also ambiguities that might have been unintentionally introduced in your, in your translation. Oh, I like that tip. I would have never thought of that one to, to put it aside and not think about it for a while and then come back and actually back translate it into the, into the source language. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Now, the next ones on your list are ask around and join a study group. So who should I ask and where do I find study groups? Well, first of all, if you have colleagues who pass the exam, ask them for tips about how they prepare. And, okay. and the study groups idea is in, in some language pairs, uh, ATA members have formed study groups where the individuals uh, critique, critique each other's work and, and kind of support each other. And candidates who we found that candidates who have participated in these sort of collaborative efforts tend to tend to perform better on the exam. Um, OK. The best place to look for these is if your your language has a language division, an ATA language division, to see if there are any um, groups in existence. And if there aren't, then think about starting one. Okay. Do you have any tips or advice for starting a study group? Well, there's a great article in the May, May June 2022 issue of the Chronicle by Jason Knapp. And it was titled, um, Forming a Peer Study Group to Prepare for ATA Certification Exam." Okay. And there he provides some really, really useful information about how to approach um, these sort of targeted study groups based on previous experience. Okay. We'll make sure to put a link to that in the uh, show notes. Now, you go on to write about a number of ATA resources that can be helpful. Can you tell us a bit more about those? Right. So most years at uh, ATA's annual fall conference, uh, there are sessions that are offered on preparing for the exam for some specific language pairs, especially Spanish. Um, but occasionally these sorts of sessions are offered at chapter meetings as well. So if a session is offered in your pair, that's a really, really good way to, to get an inside look at the exam and, and hone your skills and see they're usually offered by graders. Um, so you can kind of kind of get inside the graders mindset. Okay. Um, another way is uh, webinars. If you can't make it to the conference, think about there are some webinars. We do occasionally do webinars about certificate, specifically about certification, but even general uh, webinars about improving your translation performance um, can be helpful. And don't forget about the website. The ATA website has just a wealth of information about how errors are marked and what the error categories mean. And so having a clearer understanding of, of how the graders go about their 
um, their tasks will give you a leg up. And last yeah, but not least, um, yeah. And last but not least, uh, uh, read the certification column in the Chronicle. There's almost every issue. There's a, a content about the exam, and some of it can be very helpful for prospective candidates. For example, in seem to be in 2022, seem to have a lot of a uh, lot of good material. But the, the March April issue of 2022 addressed uh, the age old question of how literal or free a candidate should be in their translation, and it's it's an excellent article. Yeah, yeah, that was a good one, and that one has been really talked about. <laughs> For years, I've I've talked to people uh, at various conferences over the years about that one. So glad uh, that you guys put out a a piece in the Chronicle uh, on that one. You know, that's this is really a lot of information, and I'm going to throw this out again. We're going to put some links in the show notes. So anything you guys have been listening to, what David has said, not only his his Chronicle piece, but we'll also put some links directly to the certification page, the ATA website where you're going to find all these materials. And I can only encourage all of you to who are interested in taking the exam to go read that material. So, you know, I guess my last question at this point circles back to the first, you know, after all that, you know, now what? Well, if you get back a, 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 a failed practice test score, then um, don't be discouraged. Um, you should view those results as a learning opportunity. Even if you fail, now you know why and what skills you need to work on. And I hope here I've provided a number of ways to, to utilize the tools that are out there for, for people to reach their goal. Yeah, no, David, this has been a great conversation. Lots of great insights um, for people who have not yet read your column. Thank you so much. And, you know, as someone who's taken and now thankfully passed the exam a few years ago, um, I'd like to, as host, take a moment because I want to add a few words here. Um, for our listeners, I was super ner nervous about the exam. I've, I'm, I'm sure I've told this story on the podcast in the past. I, I knew the pass rate was low. And even though I had been translating for about 17 years when I took the exam, and I was confident I had the skills to pass, I just had a lot of respect for it because of the conversations that I've had. I talked to a lot of certified translators before I took. So that piece of advice really, really, um, you know, I can really, really relate to that. And I even talked to a couple of graders, which anyone who's been to the conference knows that ATA graders actually have a ribbon that says they're a grader. So if you're at the conference and you see somebody who's an ATA grader, you've got a great resource to just chat up right there. And I did that a couple of times and those insights were invaluable. I specifically remember two pieces of advice that I think made a real difference for me and I'd like to share them. Don't treat the exam like another translation job. It's a test and you should treat it like a test and think of it like a test and try to think like a grader. That's why the, your piece of advice earlier, uh, David, really, really resonated with me because I remember it maybe not just strive to understand the source text that was in front of me when I was in the exam and render it well in the target, but I was also thinking about you know, why was this text chosen? I was reading each sentence and trying to identify the various challenges in it and seeing things in, in German, uh, you know this well, David, is there's there's like filler words and 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 things that we would might call fluff that you might not translate in a normal job, but they do have a nuance and might be necessary or might not be. When you're thinking like a grader, then I think, ah, maybe that grader actually put that. Maybe that word or this text was chosen and this word is important. That's something to think about and don't take any word for granted that's in the text. And that certainly doesn't mean a one-to-one -one translation, but you think about maybe the nuance that that word might add to the text. And the texts are not meant to trip you up. I talked to many graders and everyone, and I'm sure, David, you can confirm they're not picked with tripping people up in mind, but they are chosen specifically to test different translation skills. Right. And there are specific challenges, um, but it, but they're not traps. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's no traps in there, but they're not just picked randomly. They're really, you guys have a huge process. We've talked about this in the past into how they're chosen. Um, and the graders really put a lot of time and effort into choosing these texts. So my other piece of advice is to read and reread the translation. This is what I was told 
And I did it several times carefully before turning it in before the end of the exam. And boy, did that, that paid off for me because I literally found a typo the last time I was reading through the second text, just a few minutes before the proctor said, okay, time's up. And um, so that was super value to me, not just think, okay, I'm done now and great. I get to get out of here 10 or 15 minutes early, you know, instead sit back, take a drink of water, coffee, whatever, <laughs> do a two minute meditation and then go back to your text and use that time because it's there. And uh, which makes me think of that one more tip, use every available minute. If you finish early, use the time to check and recheck your translation. And I think uh, that could that could be make the difference. You never know in the scoring with one error more or less. And uh, I remember when I took the exam, it was in DC. I was it was the in person exam, but it was the um, it was uh, the electronic exam, but in person. And I was surprised at how many people turned in their exams early and were walking out with you know 10, 15, 20 minutes left in in the three hour time period. That's really great advice. Um, yeah, I I I have proctored exam in person settings and just been amazed by how many people leave early. And this one person I remember once left halfway through, and and I said, "Are you sure you're done?" And she said, "Oh yeah, I've been doing this for twenty years." And I made note of her name and watched for her name to be certified, and she she failed. So, yeah, mm. you know, uh, I, I just don't understand. You know, you really need to just proofing is so important, um, and because of just, just you can die a death of a thousand cuts but just little things that you that you get by looking looking at it later looking you know looking at it over and over again yeah no i totally agree and that goes back to my not thinking of it as a, another translation job and um mm -hmm. i've gotten the feeling from a few conversations that i've had that that's the way seasoned translators uh, let's just say some i'm not i don't want to generalize but I have had some conversations with people who were complaining about failing the exam. And I got the feeling from them that they didn't, they they felt that because they've been translating for 20 years, they should just be able to walk in and pass the exam. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that's really uh, misguided um, because it's, it's not another translation job. You know, you can get away with sending a text to a client and massaging out some of those filler words or leaving out certain parts that you might not be super important for your target audience or for the job you're doing. But in, in the case of a text, all those, all those words do or could have an impact on the text, the nuances in the meaning and that's the graders want to see your ability to render those nuances as well. And, 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 and the way you might solve certain problems, not just to ignore them. Like some of us translators do just like, ah, that's not really important. I'll just leave that out. So that would be a, another way to, to, to end this and leave listeners with, you know, treat it like an exam and not a, not in just another translation job. Even if you've been doing it for years, respect the exam and, and then those, those uh, veteran translators will come out with a passing grade. Right. All right, David, thank you again so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. It's been super insightful and um, you know, I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Man. Take care. All right. That's a wrap. We'd like to thank everyone who helped produce today's show. Chris Silva recorded the announcements. Derek Platts mixed and edited the audio. ATA headquarters provided editorial and technical support. If you learned anything new in today's podcast, I bet there's someone out there who would like to know it too. Don't be stingy. Tell them about the podcast. I've gotten to know so many great podcasts that way. I promise they'll thank you for it. And if you're not an ATA member, listen up. I've been a member for over 20 years. Joining ATA literally launched my freelance career. It opened the door to a profession I knew very little about, and attending my first annual conference led to my very first freelance job. And I joined for the first time in 2004 as a student. My first conference blew my mind. Nowadays, the demand for translators and interpreters is at an all-time high, but finding quality work isn't easy. ATA membership can make the difference. And ATA isn't just for translators and interpreters. We have teachers and professors, hospital administrators, language company owners, and technology developers, just to name a few. Companies and institutions can join too. Our membership includes language companies, universities, and government agencies. If you'd like to know more, go to ATA's website, atanet.org. 
You can also check out past episodes of this podcast where we talk about the benefits of membership and what's currently happening in the association. But before you go, please take a quick moment to give us a rating or write a review. Tell us what you like, why you listen, or about your favorite guest. Your feedback is super helpful, and reviews help other listeners find the show too. We'd really appreciate hearing from you. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Talk to you again soon.